if we won't have Eagle football. Scott Grayson joining us now from Fox 29. Scott, welcome to the show, man. How you doing on this football I'm, Friday? I'm good, guys. How you doing? Good, Scotty. Are, are, you, are you getting through it after that debacle, the latest debacle, the house of horrors that is Raymond James Stadium for the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles? Boy, I, you know, it, it's been rare, John, when I've just wanted to turn the TV off. And that was that was one of the times. I mean, and and I don't even know how to put it into words. So you asked, am I over it? I think I'm past it. And the Phillies are certainly helping with that, you know, knowing yeah, that they're right. coming this weekend. And I think it is a great, you know, I looked at this. It's so funny how the schedule comes out. And one of the things, I don't know if you're like this, John or, or, or Xander, you look at where's the bye week? And I look at, oh, is it late in the year? And I'm usually one of those guys that's like, put it at least in the middle or later in the year where these guys can uh, get a little rest and be ready to yeah. go for the, the stretch run. But man, this bye week came at the perfect time for these guys. I feel like, you know, I'm glad they didn't have another game coming up that they quickly tried to shift into and tell all of us that we've put it behind. We flushed it. We moved on. Now, you know what? Sit with this for a little bit. Let this linger for a little bit. And, um, you know, and come out motivated to to not let that ever happen again. And man, I just feel like there's a lot of cracks in the foundation right now. And and this this house could crumble if they're not careful. Fair point. Yeah, I don't think they care as much. You know, as <laughs> as Xander pointed out, you know, they got it. They got Fortnite to play. So I mean that now to their. I always talk about the players. The players can't be emotional. I mean, they have to get back to work. They have to. You can't have these huge mood swings because guess what? Next game's coming up. Now it's a little bit different with the bye week, but you know, guys have families and four days off and vacations planned and all that kind of stuff. So real world stuff gets in the way. I think that's the nature of the NFL. You try to get by as quickly as possible. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I, I take it from your cracks in the foundation. I agree with that. And I think this was a poorly built foundation. And by that, I mean, like, how is this not predictable to Jeffrey Lurie setting this up the way he set it up? Well, it, and here's, here's my question, John. He set it up the way he set it up, which was Nick, you, you focus on running the game and the team. You keep your, your blinders are on, right? You're not looking at the offense or the defense anymore. You're, you're watching the game and you're managing the game. But as, as these weeks have gone on and we've heard Nick speak, he talks about going into the offense. He talks about calling that fake tush push on fourth down. So what lane are you driving in, Nick? Are you staying in the lane that they wanted you to be in? Or are you, you're, you're doing your thing now, man. You're, you're putting the blinker on and moving over and you're going into that offensive meeting room. And what are you telling Kellen Moore to do? And, and, and I, to me, I just think there's a lot of gray area here and some uncertainty as to, we all wanted to know, okay, what's your job, Nick? He said what his job was going to be. And I don't feel like it's staying that way. And I think there's just a lot of like, okay, well, what's going on here? And I think the players are seeing some of this and thinking, I thought he was staying out a little bit and maybe he's more involved at, you know, I just think maybe, there's a lot maybe of Allen, but that's my point, Scott. Like, and I'm not, I'm not, because I've gotten a lot of people the way you're thinking he's the head coach of the football team. You hire a head coach to be a head coach. So again, I go back to Jeffrey Lurie. I, I'm not hiring a guy to, Oh, do this, but don't do this. I mean, as he says, and he's right, whether you like him, dislike him or not, his his name is on this product, and he's I the agree. one who gets the crap for it. So he should have the right to do whatever he wants to do. And if you're Jeffrey Lurie and you're not okay with that, then you got to show the courage of your convictions and go in another direction and hire, hire somebody else to be the head coach of the football team. And to have that kind of autonomy, which has kind of been my, and Xander can tell you, it's been my point from day one. This is a brutal setup. And it all starts and it all is on the shoulders of Jeffrey Lurie. I agree with you that it's a brutal setup. It is one that Nick agreed to. Um, <clears throat> but it is also, it is also, I agree with you in the sense that every NFL head coach, look, your name's tied to that ship. When it starts to sink, you're the one going down with it. Um, and if you 
are the head coach, you should be able to do whatever you think you need to do that is best for the team. I think he's trying to do what's best for the team oh, in sure. his mind. Whether it's actually what's best for the team at times is certainly debatable. Oh, yeah. And and I think, you know, it's not like he wants to fail. It's not like he's coming in here going, hey, I don't want to score in the first quarter. I just don't <laughs> think it's fun. Let's try to score in the other three, and we'll just come yeah. from behind. And, and, and Jalen, let's keep trying to win despite losing the turnover battle because nobody's done that before. He's not doing all that. Like, that's not – but – but at some point, and this is this is why I, I like the bye week more for the coaches because it's self scouting, right? They always talk about how they self scout this week and they see and look for tendencies and what they're doing. Man, you got a lot to try to uncover here that you're creating that is not fooling anyone. Um, with the one caveat being, you know, Vic Fangio isn't out there trying to make the tackles. He's trying to put the guys in position to make the tackles. Missed tackles are happening, which means guys are in position to make tackles and are not. So there's things, though, in this self-scouting that they all have to figure out and try to look at and decide what's different. And I'll tell you one right off the top from my head, because I, I asked myself, what is different with Jalen Hurts now versus the Super Bowl year? And, and there's no threat to run. There is no threat to run for him. He doesn't look for it until second half at earliest. He does not use and does not seem to have quite the burst that he did in that one year. And teams used to have to devote a spy to him which creates one less defender in coverage, so there were more holes to throw to. There's a lot here that, that they need to evolve on or go back to and look at and say, what made Jalen so good in 2022? Let's try to do a little more of that, um, and, and it's not there. And, and that's one of the self-scouts I think needs to happen. Is that player gone, though, Scott? That's my worry. Because I've been, I, I've been tough on Jalen the last couple of weeks just because I, I – you know, we talked about – we had Les Bowen on yesterday, and we're talking about it, and I'm looking at the collapse of Wentz. At, you know, when's his big year? It looked like he could make no wrong decision. You know, he had the every athletic thing went his way. And, you know, after that, it was a collapse. Jalen, 22, same thing. Every RPO, Jalen made the right move. Every play that Jalen was in, it almost was like the football gods cast a spell of magic on him. Now it's gone. And I'm like, is that player ever going to come back? Are we using him right? I'm, I'm concerned about Jalen Hurts. Um, are you ready to talk me off the ledge? Or are you joining me on the ledge? <laughs> I, I, I'm maybe I'm walking towards the ledge. Uh, I I I think you brought up a lot of good questions. That um, number one, does he have the burst in those legs that he had after some of the injuries he's had and the hits he's taken? Uh, I don't know. Haven't seen it. Haven't seen him try to turn it on yet. Uh, I've seen him get outside and and get a few yards and then shut it down and slide or fight for an extra yard or two. But I haven't seen him try to turn on that afterburner yet. Uh, where, where is it, Jalen? You got to try, uh, you got to go for it if it's there and you got to take that, you know, but it's, it's the old adage of, is he trying to stay and be more of a throwing quarterback? Is he hate that, that knock of, uh, and, and some will call it a knock. I think it's an added strength and added tool to have if you can run and use it. The other thing is the league is not stupid. And they, they saw what the Eagles did in 22 and these defensive coordinators said, okay, how are we going to stop the RPO when the Eagles do it? They figured it out in 23. Jalen didn't start to run as much last year because of the, uh, I think he was trying to avoid some of the hits. And then he got a little banged up and wasn't running after that. So now they've seem seemingly, I, th I think, looked at the Eagles and said, we're not that worried about the RPO anymore. Um, and, and, and when the Eagles do it, let's be honest, how many times are they getting called for ineligible receivers downfield? Because yeah. guys don't know if he's passing or not. Or so Hurt he makes the wrong decision. Or right, and and there's just there's a lot. That's a loaded question. And here's my other thing that that has me uh, puzzled about Jalen. I really liked the addition of Kellen Moore. I wanted to see how Kellen would work with Jalen to evolve. I have not seen evolution. I and it makes me wonder: is Kellen the problem or is Jalen the problem? Because if you're not evolving, and what's the common denominator? It's Jalen. Then there needs look his reads, you know, we all talked about it. He needs to get better at seeing the field. He needs to get better at progressing through his reads. It's not happening. I'm still seeing the same guy trying to throw passes or hold onto the ball too long. That mental clock. Yeah. I mean, it's a problem. It's not, it's not set properly and he needs to figure that out. Longest in but, the league right now, Scott. It's yep. time to throw. He's and, actually and second. Second. But, uh, yeah. He's sacked in um, 3.1 seconds to throw for Jalen Hurts, which is second worst in the league. Now, interestingly, the worst is Brock Purdy, 3.14.
The third worst is the NFC Offensive Player of the Month, Sam Darnold, 3.07. So Mm -hmm. it's not like you can't succeed. But if you think about the offenses Brock Purdy and Sam Darnold run, it's the same offense. It's the Shanahan, the Mike, the Shanahan Kubiak offense. Traditional play action, long developing routes. They're supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. He's not supposed to, he's not playing that style of offense. And if you go all the way back, um, People talk. I, 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 you had mentioned the fourth and one, and Nick. I thought that boy. I, I said. I even said. I said, boy, he opened a Pandora's box. He didn't need to open. <laughs> I thought the similar thing when Doug Nussmeyer. I don't know if you remember Scott, but he said two point three seconds. He actually used the number two point okay. three seconds of the goal on getting the football out, which, by the way, is completely unrealistic. And Kellen Moore walked it back immediately. The the leader, by the way, the the leader in the entire NFL is Andy Dalton at 2.35. So even the leader isn't at 2.3. So to to assume that Jalen Hurts could get to that level is insane. But he's got to be middle of the road. He's got to be 2.7, 2.8. As long as he's in the yeah, it, my my thing is too, John. As I was watching that game against Tampa, uh, I I just kept seeing escape routes showing themselves where he could extend the play out to the side, and he didn't he didn't take them. Um, there were ways to extend that play. If you don't want to throw it, you want to try to make a play. Uh, listen, you want to make a play, that's fine, but get towards the sidelines, out of the pocket where you can throw it away, no grounding, or have one of your extremely talented receivers when they're back. And I know he was shorthanded in, la- in the last game, but. Um, just extend the play and find a guy who improvises. I mean, that's sort of what happened with the Paris Campbell touchdown. Um, but he, he, there were routes. There were ways for him to get out of that pocket, and he didn't take it. He stood in there too long, was too indecisive. And then by the time he, I think, wanted to try to escape, that that hole had closed. So, but, And that's where I go back to where is the film session? Where is the learning where you pause and you show him, here's what you didn't see? You had this. You could have done that. Where is that stuff in his evolution? Because I'm not. I'm just not seeing it. And 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 it's it's a stat. All stats are meant to be guides. You know, if he holds the ball for three three and a half seconds because he's extending those plays heading towards the sidelines. Okay. You know, you're not getting sacked. You're not fumbling it or in a strip sack. You're not throwing interceptions. If all that's happening, this team will automatically be better. It's just, it's got to be a fact. I mean, you're not giving teams shorter fields. You're not taking points off the board where you're almost about to have them. Uh, he's got to be a lot You're right. I, and I like your thought on the stat aspect because sometimes it's good to extend the play. And obviously right. that's going to skew Jalen Hurts' stats versus somebody like Brock Purdy is going to, mm-hmm. you know, simply throw from the pocket more often than not. But, um, so I agree with you there. So to me, it comes down to when it's clear the ball is supposed to come out, it doesn't come out. I think that's the problem. And too often, if it's a timing route, if it's a trust route, too often the ball's not coming out on time. Like you see last night's game, you know, Kirk Cousins was cooking. We talked about it before you came mm-hmm. on. The ball's out on time. Mm-hmm. Before the break, throwing guys open. You just don't see that with Jalen Hurts. That's kind of the evolution you're hoping to get to. And I just don't see any evidence it's getting better. Some of that, John, I will say, I think comes down to trust in receiver. And some of these other quarterbacks are willing to trust guys sooner than I feel Jalen is. I think he's yep. finally there with Devontae and AJ that if I know they're going to break here, and I will throw it to that spot, and they will be there. I feel like he feels that way with those two guys, which is where when we see open receivers that are not named, uh, you know, Devontae Smith or A.J. Brown, the, he's slow to release the ball. And I, I think there's that trust that isn't there. For whatever reason, that he doesn't trust those guys or have as much of a rapport with them. Um, but your pros and other pro quarterbacks – 
don't care who they are. If they're wearing a pro jersey, he's going to trust that guy. I think Cousins yeah. is one of those guys. Yeah. And and you'll see him throw picks because I think he trusts guys sometimes yeah. too much that he doesn't. And Jalen isn't that guy. He's not there. And, you know, he's got to find a way to get there. I mean, you are a pro quarterback. You are supposed to be a franchise quarterback. Um, lead by example. And when you throw that ball on time and it's supposed to be at a certain spot and the guy isn't there, you know, not saying you, you cause a scene on the sidelines, but in those film sessions, in those meeting rooms, listen, man, I'm putting the ball where it's supposed to be. It is your job to be there. That kind of leadership or have other risk, you know, some of the other receivers go up to him and say that. Um, and I think that this team's missing some of that. And, uh, you know they got to and, and and I'm just I mentioned it earlier. I, I just this if this team doesn't score in the first quarter, they're not going to win a lot of games. It's just it, you're playing from behind with a defense that is built to have be able to play with the lead, and and they aren't. That's coming down to it. It's an egregious problem uh, with the opening scripted plays. And you know what? And I thought about that, and I was willing to. I was ready to blame Kellen Moore for some of that. Where is this scripted? Be I hear Jalen checking out of a lot of stuff at the line. A lot yeah, he's still in, he's got way more autonomy. So that part, and that's something you've wanted and it's, he's gotten. And I'm questioning some of that. I'm wondering if there needs to be a little bit of a tighter leash on some of that, because I, I, I wonder how many times he's checking out of plays into things that are not, you know, I, he has keys he's reading. He has things he's, but privately behind the scenes, I wonder how many times or if Kellen Moore's getting frustrated with how much he's checking out of stuff. It's a good point. Yeah. I wonder if that's an be. explanation for why everybody's out there saying, you know, it looks like Nick's offense. Me and John talk about it all the time, and John's like, it's not Nick's offense. <laughs> but, you know, some of the similarities do exist. And I'm not I'm saying that Kellen calling it or that Nick's even in a Oh, yeah. There's I'm some, there's some I, the nominators, the quarterback. You know, and that's that's where it is. I that's was it. talking to Mike Gill, your buddy Scott, yesterday about this very thing, and I asked him, I and I'll ask you guys, you, as you just said, what's the common denominator? Everybody, Nick Sirianni, Shane Steichen, this and that, uh, Brian Johnson, Alex Tanny, Doug Nussmeyer, Kellen Moore, all these people you have problems with as as a fan base. What is the common denominator between all of them? Jalen Hurts. At yeah. some point, you got to get to the the core of it, and that the fact that so many people are so convinced, Scott Grayson, that Nick has taken over the offense in bad spots, and when it's good, it's good. I mean, it's the quarterback. I, I I will say not. I agree with you entirely. I will say Nick has uh, made questionable decisions that I have. He's left points on the board. Uh, off well, the, the board, fourth yeah. down, that's different. I'm saying offensively, yeah. Kellen Moore's making the game plan. Um, that doesn't mean other people don't contribute. I think that that is the Pandora's box that Nick opened that he shouldn't have opened. Because, I love that reference. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, you know, Doug Peterson used to be honest about it. He used to tell us uh, – Press Taylor's uh, responsible for red zone and Rich Gangarilla's responsible for two minutes. Every major offensive coach contributed to the game plan. Jeff Stoutland's obviously the run game coordinator. Then it, you know, at the time that that was Doug Peterson, when Nick was doing it, it would be Nick. Um, and now it's Kellen Moore and they're the final say they, they get to say, all right, this is the game plan for the week. And, you know, so basically what happened on that fourth and one play is they decided during the week that if they got in that type of situation, fourth and one, they were going to roll out the fake tush push. And Nick is trying to protect Kellen Moore. He's like, that one's on me. That one's on me, which he should as the head coach. But this stuff is done during the week and it's all put together. And, but he opened that box, and nobody wants to hear that context. Nobody. No, no, no. And I, I think the best situation is to have you know the more heads the better, uh, to a certain extent, where you're creating a game plan, and then once it gets to be in the game, but you have to have that understanding. That's why I go back to the you know the audibles, the changing of the plays. Um, you know where are the guardrails on doing that? 
uh, are there any at all? You know, it makes me wonder how all that is structured behind the scenes. Um, Because, listen, you go one or two weeks without scoring in the first quarter. Okay. You know, maybe it's just the other team's defense was was that good and on you and and ready to stop you and those. Okay, fine. Well, four weeks in a row and in six weeks when you go back to the last two games of last year, that's that's that is a big problem. And and I just think there's something that has whether it's no checking out of plays, Jalen, on the first two drives, whatever it happens to be, or you no. know, you, you don't check out of the plays until I give you the green light. Whatever it has to be, so that you can get something going. I mean, you know, I, I, again, I just hear the checking happening at the line of scrimmage a lot lately, and it seems like it's happening more and more, which tells me he's t- completely throwing away whatever play call was there and going with whatever options are set up in his audible structure. Um, which is generally, I mean, you know, you basically kill from run to pass or vice sure. versa. Um, and most plays in the modern NFL have two, and I apologize. I got all kinds of lawn work going around me. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but it's driving me crazy. Just started coming through. It's fine though, John. You're good. But, um, so anyway, and they're supposed to not be here until 10, but I digress. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be yelling at some people, but anyway, I digress that, that the, the point of the whole uh, Jalen Hurts in the in the, the most plays are built in that way in the modern NFL. You have a you basically kill from run to pass or pass to run, and you know Tom Brady talks about this all the time to his credit, and the two best ever were Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. You know your job as a quarterback is to get the team in the right play. If you see something and it's obvious they loaded the box and they're going to stop the run and you check out. And you try to get the team in into the best uh, play possible. Is Jalen at that level to have that kind of autonomy? Probably not. But he wants it. He wants more after going through what Kellen Moore, uh, uh, what Jason Kelsey meant to that pass protection scheme, and that's why they brought in Kellen Moore to to get this started, so to speak. And to get him up to speed with this kind of stuff. And maybe he's just not ready for it. But I think you're right, Scott. The common denominator is Jalen Hurts to all of this. And at some point, you got to stop thinking he's a shrinking violet and point these things out and say, look, this is not good enough. And I like Scott's idea, by the way. Maybe it's time to scale back. Maybe it's time to scale back to where it was. There we say. Yeah. Even just until you kind of get a a rhythm going, like th- this team has had in four games. Have you felt, even when it was going well at times, if you could even say it went well, they kind of lucked into. Some... Have you felt like there's been any kind of a rhythm yet, other than the fact that Saquon's going to kind of break one run? At yeah, some he's going he's to hit a home run. run. Yeah. he's got a home run hitter. That's yeah. about it. So it's other than that. I really haven't felt there's any kind of rhythm to this offense yet. So if you were to say, like you said, John, scale it back until a rhythm has been formed and found and it's getting a little bit more consistent and then say, okay, slowly take the reins off a little bit. Let him, you know, have a little more autonomy again, because now with there comes a feel, you get a feel for the game better, a feel for your teammates, a feel for what it's like when you're in that rhythm and, and you can go from there. That's a place where you can grow. But until yeah. you can get into that, you got to get that. You got to get that first step in the right direction first. And 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 I, yeah, I, I, John. I mean, I, I think that's. I think that's where they need to go. I think they need to, as you said, I like your phrase there. Scale it back uh, in terms of some of the autonomy and the freedom that Jalen Hurts has mm-hmm. to get this offense, get the car running, right? Get it going from first into second gear, and maybe second to third gear, and then let him start. You know. Feathering the gas pedal a little bit more. I mean, I, 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 you got to do something different. You know, definition of insanity. And and yeah. and I'm not seeing anything different through these first four games. Scott, I want to ask about the defense here as we close out. I'll get close to closing out the interview. You know, one thing's guaranteed, and that's that the offense is going to look better after the bye week because AJ Brown and Devontae Smith and Lane Johnson are coming back. Right. Well, the defense had everybody, and they didn't look too good. What's the fix on defense, Scott Grayson? How are you feeling about the defense right now through four weeks? 
I, I was, again, I, funny, I start with the coordinators and I kind of digress from there uh, in terms of calming myself down with who I'm mad at. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I saw that defense and, and it was obvious early in the game. Their game plan was Baker will not hold the ball. He is going to take his drop and get rid of it somewhere. And the Eagles were unable to get a pass rush as a result of that, uh, which was brilliant on Tampa's part. And then also they kept dissecting that zone that the Eagles were running a lot. And and, and I went back to then, this is where I was frustrated with Vic. I didn't see uh, adjustments really. Um, you know, again, we're sitting in a, in a defense where there's no real bump and run or trying to get guys off the time. It's all timing when you're going to do that, right? It's obvious. The quarterback is on a timing with his receivers. He's going to drop back and let it go because in, in like by the time he hits that third step, my receiver is supposed to be here. Well, the only way you can kind of divert that is to run some sort of bump. And, you know, you got to get press those guys off of their routes. And you saw that when the Eagles got the touchdown to Paris Campbell. Dallas Goddard was bumped off his route and basically taken out of the play. And it was a little improvising there that caused the Eagles to find that touchdown. You got to do that a little bit with these guys. Baker was able to pick apart the Eagles because his first option was pretty much open when he had the timing route. And there was no adjustments to try to change the timing or to try to go into man, really, to try to divert some of that and keep from those, those holes opening up. And I feel like the linebackers were playing too shallow in those, in those zones. Uh, that we're allowing those guys to have plenty of room to operate. They've got to fix that stuff up too. Um, you're right. You know the guys were there, and 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 there were 16 missed tackles in the yeah. game. So that's where that's where I go from Vic and say, listen, you know it's not it's it's you know I can get frustrated a little bit with the with the setup and maybe not not pressing those guys. Uh, but at the end of the day, there were opportunities to potentially get off the field, and they didn't make the tackles to do it. And that's on the players. That is. I'm glad you brought that up at S. Grayson, Fox 29, because I think too often uh, people want to blame the coaches. And when you do miss, and to the Eagles, the Eagles in house accounting said 15. So it wasn't quite as bad as 16, but still 16, 15. If you're over 10, it's a bad day, Scott. <laughs> and I uh, feel like, John, I don't, I don't know if you feel this way or not. Um, to me, it's not a new problem. I know we talked about it with Nick and stuff a couple of weeks ago um, after a game where there were so, you know, generous amount of missed tackles then too. So, you know, other teams don't seem to be missing tackles like the Eagles are. So where is the problem? And I know in this new NFL, you're not hitting much during the week, if, if at all. Um, but you, I mean, they have things called tackling dummies for a reason. And I think these guys really need to use them. Because they're they're not making the play. They're, the technique isn't there. I see C.D. Gardner Johnson diving at guys like Deion Sanders used to. Business decisions, you know, go up and make the play. Um, you know, with C.J., they lost the game, so everybody forgets that fourth and one stop by C.J. Right. Gardner Johnson. Awesome, all time stop. In a big situation, if they would have went on and win that game, we'd be talking about that for years, I think. That was how good that stop was. How can a guy do that and then be – I, I, it's unbelievable to me. I agree. I agree. And and when the Eagles were getting – look, I, you know, they're human beings, right? And I will give them this. If I was playing on that defense and I look up, I'm exhausted because it's hotter than heck out there. I've had to be on the field a lot because my offense can't get a first down. I look up and I see the total yards are 254 to nothing. You know, I can't say I would start thinking about making business decisions myself because does it seem like your team's going to come back in that game in that moment? You're probably looking down the line going, yo guys, you going to move the ball at all? Like we need a break. We're hot. We're tired. We're exhausted. We've been on the field for two thirds of the game so far. Uh, you know, uh, in, 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 uh, it, it's not saying it's okay. I'm not saying it's okay. They're professional athletes are getting paid. But trying to understand a little bit of the psyche and, and explain maybe what a C.J. Gardner-Johnson, how he can make that one play and then not those others. Man, I can't imagine how, how frustrated those guys were 
in that first half, watching that offense. Yeah, it's a complimentary game, man. And when you go three and out, three and out, three and out, but even that, and and people, and we criticize the slow starts, and rightfully so, you know, there was the Dallas Goddard play we talked about. Yeah, perfect he makes catch, that catch. Perfect throw, make the catch, you know. Execution is such a big part of it. But, you know, even I'll give an homage to my old partner, Jody Mack. When you're struggling this badly and you win the toss, why not take the football? Again, do something different. I agree with you. I wondered that myself. Um, especially if you have a slow start problem, at least that would limit one possession in the first half for the other team. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, they they got to do something different. And and I, I look at this team, John, and I, I just think that, um, look, they're two and two. Uh, the whole season is still in for they're not even a quarter of the way through this thing now that they're playing 17 games and and you can't write the book on this team yet it's not it's not even close to written this division is wide open i think there's a lot of parity in this league to the point where uh, uh, you know it's going to be a lot of teams and tiebreakers that are going to decide some of these playoff spots but a falcons loss like you had i'll give you this one you were missing three starters on offense that's fine i, I you know you know it is what it is, but you got to come out and show that you, you know, we talk about the, the, the new NFL these days is the, the preseason is the first four games of the regular season. That's kind of the way I feel. Uh, okay. Preseason's over, but you guys didn't come out of it trending in the right direction. So you better fix a lot of things. And, and I think that's where this team's at. Uh, but, but I will say you see some of the stuff going on with slay um, some of the things that are happening uh, the way these guys are behaving a little bit. They wanted to say last year was last year. I don't know how you feel, John, but when you're in that locker room and you're, you're just around these guys, uh, I'm the ones who were here. I feel like last year was not just last year. I feel like they're wondering and worrying that last year is consider is continuing into this year. Scott, are they going to turn this thing around? The one thing I look at, Xander, that makes me feel optimistic is the schedule. You know, as it turns out, right, because you never truly know who these teams are. You think right. you do? That was a tough forced four-game stretch. Yeah, it was. Green Bay in Brazil. You survived that. Uh, Atlanta, you should have won that. But Atlanta's proving to be a better team than I think we thought, uh, at least I thought, coming in. So you go, okay, uh, that team's legit. The Saints, you won that game. You look pretty good doing it. And then you come back and you lay a stinker against the Bucs with three of your top offensive players out. So what are you? I have no idea what this team's identity is at this point, but I will say going two and two through that stretch, if I didn't have to watch it, if you just, if I didn't have to see all that happened that led to it, if you told me they'd be two and two coming out, I'd go, all right. I was thinking three and one, but two and two means you're right there. Add in, add in too, if you didn't watch it. Hey, AJ Brown was missed three games too. Right, and so, yeah. but then I look at you got the Browns. What do you got? You got Browns, and then uh, is it the Bengals? Uh, Browns, uh, Browns, Giants, Giants, Bengals, Jags. and Jaguars. Yeah. Those are four very winnable games to me. Very winnable games that if they can get this thing going, and then you talk about build. I talked about building a rhythm, building some momentum. I think there's a real opportunity in these four games to put the train on the track and start leaving the station here. But um, and part of it is because these four opponents, we are starting to see a little bit of what they are. And I think there's opportunities here for this team to turn it around. So if we said four game segments here after the next four, if they go three and one in that and they're sitting here at five and three, I think there's a lot of Eagle fans that would take that. I think these are four very winnable games and I think it's possible they could be six and two. Um, but they've got a lot to figure out. And, and this bye week needs to be utilized in the proper way and they need to come back ready to work. Um, and, and I think those are the keys to kind of getting this thing, getting it right. Scott, thanks for joining yeah. today, man. Great stuff. Uh, as always appreciate it. What about oh, uh, three Scott over the next four? What's and that? The whole, the whole world collapses. If they're one in three. Oh yeah. yeah. Over the oh yeah. Four. The line at the bend and, and add into it. If the Phillies don't win the world series, oh, you got a no, long wait, line. You, you went too you far. Add into now. it that the Phillies don't get by the Mets. Yeah. That's what I'm worried about, Scott. Well, 
I know. You know what? The Mets had to empty the tank to get. Yeah, through that's the true. But they're a resilient true. team. That's a tough battle. So we'll see yeah. uh, how that goes, Scott. And I will say they're winnable games, but they're also losable. losable. Games. So let's, <laughs> With yeah, this let's team, go. anything is possible. That's true. <laughs> Make sure you guys follow Scott on Twitter at sgraysonfox29. Uh, follow all his work. He does a great job for Fox 29. Scott, thanks, man. We'll talk to you again soon. And Scott.